Okay, I think this is working now. First attempt was a little weird there. I wasn't getting a connection. I'm just gonna uh, talk for a few seconds while people hopefully tune in. Seems like in general in the world today that uh, internet connections have been a little bit lower. I think there's a lot of people doing this sort of thing I'm doing. Hi everybody, hi. Okay, we got some people coming in. I'm just gonna do some waving. Hi, thanks so much for tuning in uh, for Greek Speak. Uh, I'm George O'Connor. Just gonna uh, blather on for a few more seconds while people join up. I hope everyone's doing good. Um, where I'm coming from in New York, it's actually a beautiful sunny day. I just had to close the windows to my place. I was letting some air in. It was really dark and gloomy here for a few days. It was, uh, it was frankly, it was a bit of a bummer. And I'm normally a pretty happy guy, but it was getting to me. So I'm very grateful today that the weather has gotten a bit nicer. So, um, First things first, uh, this is uh, just a little, I guess we call it house cleaning and not in the literal sense because if you were to like go on my shelves, you'd see how dirty everything is here. Uh, this is my first time flying completely solo. If you've been watching previous installments of Greek Speak, you will hear me speaking to someone off camera, <clears throat> pardon me, right to my right. It's my lovely assistant, Nicole. She is wrapped up in doing other projects today. Um, it's funny how now that we're all trapped in a house, I feel like we are more busy than we've ever been before. Does that make sense? So uh, yeah, today it's just me flying solo. Not 100% solo, because somewhere all around me, I have three cats. Uh, they're lovely cats. They're all very rambunctious. They're sitting there staring at me right there right now. Um, I'm hoping, because they're very curious cats, they're not gonna knock over the camera and stuff. But if they do, you know what? That's the perils of live entertainment, right? I mean, it'll actually be kind of exciting. You'll get to see more of my house too. Be like, oh, that's what his ceiling looks like. The paint's cracked. So, <clears throat> hi, yeah, this is Solo George. Only to, like, nobody else here except for cats. A Couple other things. So, um, this week we've been broadcasting from my actual email account, my actual Facebook, the George O'Connor, my Instagram. You know it because you're here. It looks like we're going to be switching back to Word bookstores for next week. There's a couple reasons for that. Um, first and foremost, um, let me just get some feedback here. I'm going to hold up one of my patented signs been talking with Word about doing like maybe a three-day comics class. I'm still working on the um, on the actual format. I hope to have something written up and that we could post on Word pretty soon. Uh, this will not be something that would be for free. There will be a cost in this. It won't be astronomical. And what's really important to stress about this cost is that 100% of the proceeds are going to support Word. I'm not doing this for anything for myself. I'm doing this to help a bookstore that I really love. So because I'll be, it looks like I'm gonna be doing some more work with them. Um, if you've just joined me before, we started this under the auspices of Word. Word is a great independent bookstore here in Brooklyn and across the river in Jersey City. And I'm really you know, interested in trying to help them out. Also, to be honest, we get more viewers for this when I'm on Word. Word has over 20,000 people who subscribe to their Instagram. I don't even have 2,000. I mean, I appreciate everybody who's here. I love that you guys are here. Uh, I just never was much of an Instagrammer until just recently. Now that I have this kind of message, like that I, you know, there's a reason we're all stuck inside. Now I've been doing a lot more numbers going way up and I'm grateful for it, but I'd really love to like maybe, so we're probably gonna bring this back to Word it's gonna be in the same 4 p.m. time slot because I hope you're watching Word at 3 p.m. One of my best buddies in the world, Julie Foliano, has been doing amazing. I did a pass off to her. Uh, she's been doing this amazing thing, talking about her picture book. She has this whole thought of the day idea that she's been doing. And uh, every single day, uh, she's had like a different creator on. Today she had Christian Robinson. Yesterday she had Jillian Tamaki. These are other illustrators, like huge illustrators she's worked with. So I hope you check that out. Um, I can put that down now, right? So if you have any interest in that workshop, even if you just, just put an email there, like, you know what, that sounds cool. We'd like to work with George O'Connor. The thing I'm working on right now, I would be doing comics with you uh, and your kids. <laughs> if you are kids, you hopefully don't have kids, you know what I'm saying. Um, maybe like with a mythological bent, but talking more about like the general act of making comics in general. So I'm pretty excited about it. Um, 
I know that there's been a lot of people wondering about um, past videos. You can always go to my YouTube. Uh, this is George Olympians. Pretty easy to find. I, I archive all these up here. I didn't get yesterday's up yet. I have to do a little editing, but that's going to be up there. And, um, okay. I think that's it for, like, the stuff I wanted to go over. Sorry I keep disappearing off hand. I'm, it's, I'm just by myself. There's nobody to hand me stuff anymore. Also, I want to talk a little bit about uh, format. So um, yesterday, I didn't know this was a thing. Um, you, if you were watching, you may notice that I very kind of abruptly was like, oh, we should wrap this up. We spoke so long yesterday. We spoke for a full hour that actually, apparently, there's a limit on how long an Instagram Live can go. Instagram is giving me a countdown. So I realized I've been making these too long. There's a few spots I could kind of trim it down. And one of the things I'm like, oh, you know what? I've been having a lot of fun reading people's like gods and goddesses, but that took a long time. I still appreciate people saying them in and I'll still share pictures. And what today I'm going to do, I'm going to share some pictures. So uh, these are just, you know, cause that's quicker. Uh, these are pictures that people have drawn and sent in. First up, check this out. This kind of, I mean, this almost looks like abstract art. I kind of love this one. This is Hades and Persephone. And the note that came with it, you can see Hades, you can see Persephone. Persephone's dress is the color of pomegranates and all the blue is sapphires because he's also the god of wealth. I'm like, wow, way to go. That was from, sorry, uh, that was from Eleanor. She's five years old and already an amazing talent. Here, now this, check out this drawing. I mean, what, what, what? Clearly, this is not by a five-year-old. This was by, it says, architect, armorer, night jar, you artifice spinner. I think that's actually a little bit of a P in to her. Um, uh, this is uh, from Dr. Caitlin Prowitt. She is a Latin teacher. This is legit. This is somebody who really knows her stuff. So I'm going to be very self-conscious of all my pronunciations today and hope she just doesn't know Greek as well as she knows Latin. Uh, let's see also what we have here. Um, oh, okay. Here we have... Oh, oh this shine's pretty bad because of that. Oh, there we go. There's Athena. That's a beautiful drawing. Then we have... <laughs> this one I really like. Look at the expression on Hades' face. That is really good, right? Like, that's like a legit, really well-captured expression. And then this one, one of the hardest things to draw, and I know this is based on the drawing, is like that head-on look. Look at this Persephone. That's beautiful. These are all by Joseph. Um, Joseph actually sent me a really nice thank you, which I'll, I'll try to remember to look up too, on a separate letter. Joseph has been like an MVP. Joseph, thank you. You're an amazing artist. Um, this year, like two more, right? Uh, this, uh, there is a, uh, a little bit of a superstar here. His name is Shiloh. Uh, Shiloh often has been sharing videos of Shiloh's, uh, uh, interpretive <laughs> dances. Shiloh will get there sometimes with amazing props. Sometimes just Shiloh standing in front of a wall and will sing amazing pians that he's composing on the spot about goddesses or gods. Hades. I mean, this is pretty cool. His mom wrote this down because I think Shiloh's only five, so he's not writing this down. Uh, Hades was expressly drawn in cool colors, right? And then he's surrounded with warm colors. Like, I'm like, wow, like to be under, I didn't understand the cold and warm color concept until I was in college, but I was a late bloomer. And let's slow those up with uh, one more. Oh, and by one more, it's actually a bunch more. So this is from the brother-sister team of Nora and Drake. I'm going to have to do a little zooming in because they attach it as a PDF. This is Nora's Athena. That is Nora's Hades. And look at all this. Like, I'm pretty sure that's the shades of the dead there. Look at that. That's like such a great thing. And I'm pr to further and also like diamonds and jewels above because God of wealth. And then there's Persephone, and she's also looks like she's digging up jewels, or maybe she's looking at the pomegranate being like, hmm, pretty hungry. Also surrounded by either the Arenes, the Fates, uh, I mean the Furies, or perhaps that is more Shades of the Dead. I think it's more Shades of the Dead. So, Nora, that's great. And then let's just check out, as the final thing, these are from Nora's brother, Drake. And uh, this is, of course, this is Athena. And then right here is Hades. 
So these are great. Thank you all so much. So this is the new leaner, meaner thing. I'm still gonna do my talk. And today, uh, of course, we're gonna be talking about Poseidon. Now, you've maybe heard me say this before. If you've ever seen me talk, I tend to go to this as a go-to story about me. I think it's, I write about it extensively in my own book, Poseidon. Um, writing Poseidon was the hardest book of the entire Olympian series. I had a very difficult time with this one. And I think this picture, this is like a poster here, I think this is like a perfect backdrop for why Poseidon is so tricky. His personality is all over the place, right? Sometimes he is super cool and calm and serene, and then like in a second, he could become this raging god monster. And that's because Poseidon, well, he is the god of many things, right? Poseidon is the god, strangely, of horses, but I'll get to that later why, a theory about why he's the god of horses. He is the god of earthquakes, which kind of makes sense because earthquakes are connected to the ocean and that they create, like, you know, tsunamis and such. And he's, most importantly, he's the god of the sea. And the way to think of him as the god of the sea, um, I, like, all right, he does look a little bit like Aquaman. Somebody says it, but Aquaman stinks, right? Uh He's not like Aquaman. It's not just he could breathe underwater. I'm pretty sure Poseidon doesn't even breathe. He's a god. I don't think he's. I don't think he needs aerobic, you know, stuff. I think he just is right. So Poseidon uh, doesn't. It's actually breathes underwater. It's not that he can control the water, though he totally can. Clearly, um, it's like he is the water. He is the sea. And I know Oceanus is really the sea, you know, or the ocean, or what. You know, there's a lot of gods that overlap in this. But Poseidon embodies the sea in a way that, like. It's, you know, it really speaks to his character. And his character, oh, I'm going to take this poster down because one of the other things I want to do here, I want to spend a little bit more time drawing. Seems that the feedback I get, people really like when I draw. And honestly, I haven't been drawing quite enough. I think I maybe, uh, what I, I'm going to do, I'm going to do kind of like a, a quicker drawing of Poseidon. This is something that people who are drawing along at home can maybe use as a template if they so choose. You'll notice from the drawing, some people draw stuff that looks like my gods or goddesses, and some people go into completely different directions. And that's one of the great things about drawing the Greek gods. They can change shape. They can look like anything you want. If you wanted to draw Poseidon looking like a fish sandwich, which would be a weird thing to do, but that would be your prerogative because he could be a fish sandwich if he so chose. So uh, Poseidon. Remember how I talk about my designs? There's always a few clues in the way I draw them for the way they're actually going to look. With Poseidon, one of the big things, his eyebrows are a pair of angry waves. He has the most arched eyebrows of any of the Olympians. And part of that is because of the waves. And part of it is because he's kind of maybe the crankiest Olympian. You know, we, 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 in this show, we come down a lot. We make fun of, uh, I'm going to move this just a little bit. Uh, we make fun a lot of Ares for being a bloodthirsty murderer. And we make fun of Apollo for being a bit of a bloodthirsty murderer. But, like, they're not as kind of mercurial in temperament as Poseidon. He really is all over the place. And anyone who's ever been to a beach knows that that's the way it is. Sometimes the water, you know, it's just cool wave, cool wave, cool wave. Boom! Wave knocks you over. That's like the Poseidon experience. So angry waves. If this was in color, he'd have eyes the color of the sea. One of the things I've talked about um, whenever I do one of these design descriptions, if I can find an actual description in an ancient text of what the god looks like, that I have to include. Because the ancient Greeks were very hesitant to say anything about what the gods look like. And with Poseidon, I know his eye color not because something someone directly said about Poseidon, but actually a description I found about Aphrodite, where a, a, a history writer, I believe it was Pausanias, records that they had a, uh, a portrait of um, Aphrodite, and her eyes were the same color of Poseidon's, the same color as the sea. And in this particular town where this portrait existed, the people there, in Pausanias' uh, opinion, erroneously believed that they were related, that she was the daughter of Poseidon because they had eyes the same color. And he's like, of course not, just because they both come from the sea. So his eyes are the color of the sea. And if you look in Olympians, whenever I color this, it's the exact same color as the sea. Uh, he has the same sort of nose that pretty much all the Olympians do, the little bit of the crook. 
I don't tend to draw him smiling. In fact, if you count times I've accidentally drawn him smiling, which happens every once in a while when I'm signing a bunch of books at a signing, um, I've maybe drawn him smiling 13 times. He looks weird smiling. If you want to see some examples of him smiling, look in my book, um, Aphrodite. There's like a three panel sequence where you're slowly zooming in on her face as the gods are talking to her and they meet her for the first time. And you see Poseidon smiling and it's kind of weird. He doesn't have sharp teeth, but there's something very shark-like about it. He's a guy that's like, you know what? I think I feel better when you're being a little cranky beside him. Uh, if you tuned in yesterday, I discussed Poseidon's older brother, Hades. Poseidon is the middle child of the first generation of Olympians of the brothers. Zeus is the baby, Hades is the big brother, and Poseidon's in the middle. And I feel like a lot of Poseidon's personality is tied into that. Not every middle child is like this, but oftentimes in a family, a middle child has to work harder to get noticed. And Poseidon has had to work hard to get noticed. And plus he's got the added indignity. His little brother is his boss, kind of. His brother Zeus is the god of the universe. I'm like, that's not cool. If my brother was my boss, my little brother, I'd be super cranky about it too. And when I spoke yesterday, when I drew Hades, I said Hades has the best cheekbones. Poseidon has the second best cheekbones. Zeus's cheekbones, while still very beautiful. They're just, uh, they're like the third. He's just not trying. He's the king of the gods. He's like, I don't care. I, I'm a fine. Poseidon makes sure he's good cheekbones. Another detail of Poseidon's appearance that I got from ancient texts, his hair looked like seaweed, which is interesting because I think a lot of times when people um, like draw Poseidon, they think of him as having like white flowing hair. That, you know, kind of like King Triton. Remind me to get back to King Triton from Little Mermaid a little bit. But he, yeah, he didn't have white hair. His hair was like seaweed, long, slimy, green, well, maybe not slimy. So I give him like this kind of long, flowy hair. When I'm drawing, I want you to notice, I move my whole arm. And that's not just because I'm drawing big here. That's the way I always draw. It's a really good tip for anybody who's drawing at home. It's going to feel really weird at first, but when you draw, take your pencil and move your whole arm to draw it. Because you get these flowing lines. And there's my Poseidon. He's almost done. There's one detail missing. In fact, if you're looking at book parts in the book where I draw him when he's first been vomited up by his dad, Kronos, he looks like this. But he doesn't look right. I think we all know Poseidon needs facial hair. And uh, we know his hair looks like seaweed. So I don't want to give him a beard. I tried him with the beard. He looks really weird. He's like got like a yard of like dirty seaweed hanging off his face. It looks gross. It's yucky. But he doesn't look right without it. So instead... I gave him so long seaweed mustache. Now it's the Poseidon we know and love. And if you screenshot that, or you just go back and watch the video again later, where it'll be archiving on YouTube, uh, that could be your template to draw your own Poseidon. But as I talk a little bit more about Poseidon, I kind of want to draw, I've been keeping my drawings pretty simple, right? And I kind of want to draw something like just a little bit more complicated maybe like his body maybe him doing something right maybe uh maybe him holding up his trident so uh i mean i'm not planning this out so this might be a stinky drawing and that's okay one of the things i talk about when you draw sometimes you're gonna mess up i'm a professional artist this is my job i draw every day and most of my drawings are mess ups and that's okay because i screw up a lot and we all should let's draw his hand holding the trident. The trident was a gift to him by his uncles, the Cyclopes. I don't know if you guys know what trident means. I think this is a super cool factoid. Nobody else seems to think it's as cool as I do, but I'm going to share it anyway. The tri part is obvious, right? One, two, three, tri. But does anybody know what dent means in this instance? Think of a word that exists in English today that has the word dent as the first part of it. Think of a word, dentist. Trident means three teeth. This thing is called three teeth because it has the three points. Like, I think that's super cool. That's why Poseidon's is the bident. It's, I'm not, Hades is the bident, so I got two points. How neat is that, right? Somebody just guessed teeth. All right, good. Um, all right, let's get, he's holding up his, his mighty trident. He is one of the more physically impressive looking gods. 
The gods, of course, can look like anything they want, but when I draw Poseidon, I tend to draw him looking... He's maybe the buffest, with the exception of, I would say, Hephaestus. I mean, Hephaestus is, like, almost, like, ape-like. His arms are so big, right? He works the forge all day. Hephaestus clearly doesn't care what he looks like. Poseidon is still a god who's very interested in being attractive. He's like his brother like that. He's not a good husband. He's got a lot of girlfriends on the side. So he spends a lot of time making sure that he looks good. Now, for someone like me, I would have to do push-ups and sit-ups and go to the gym, and I'm not going to do that. So I just don't look that good. But Poseidon looks really good, and he could just do it just by, yeah, I'm a shape, shape changer. Look at me today. I got huge muscles. I mean, it'd be pretty awesome if that could be how you did it. One of the things I wanted to talk about, because we've mentioned a lot how the Greek gods are often the same as their Roman equivalents. With Apollo being the big exception, Apollo doesn't have a Roman equivalent because the Romans just didn't have one. So Apollo is the most Greek god. He's only Greek. He comes over there, right? Poseidon's Greek and uh, Roman equivalent is Neptune. And it's very interesting to me the incredible difference in their stature as a result of the two different cultures. And what I mean by that is the Greeks were astounding sailors. Except for maybe the Phoenicians, there was nobody alive at the time who could sail as well as the Greeks. So Poseidon had a very central role. And even though he was this unreliable, kind of like very destructive and a little bit scary god, he places this important, important role in Greek mythology and in Greek religion. The Romans... They're good at a lot of things. They weren't great sailors. They were more of like a land war type of person, right? They would use boats to get places, but like they weren't like the, it wasn't like the Greek Navy. It was like the Romans like, okay, yeah, we're like we, we have to cross that river. And like, I figure like 90% of us are going to drown, but we got a lot of people. That's an exaggeration. But so Neptune is, is a much more diminished figure in the Roman pantheon. And you actually, you see like his imagery kind of being co-opted to like be representatives of rivers. Because again, that was more the sort of water that level that the Romans would hit. And it's, it's, it's always interesting to me how these same gods, you know, same gods, because there's differences, are different in different cultures. Like the way Ares is kind of like the closest thing the Greek myths have, like the Olympians have to a bad guy. But then the Romans, like... It's Mars. He's one of their most powerful and important gods, and he's beloved. You know, like, he would have, like, temples and like, just about every single Roman, like, settlement. And he had his fields of Mars. They'd be right outside of the main part of the city because that's where the soldiers would practice. And it was not a good idea to have soldiers in the city for various reasons. But it's, like, so interesting, the difference between the characters. So there we have, let's do the mustache. The hair. It's a gift to be able to draw the, swirl, the swirling hair. Most of my favorite characters to draw, like Poseidon or Aphrodite, their hair is just going all over the place because it's just so fun to draw. He's, of course, not smiling because he is Poseidon. And let's make some, like, force lines kind of going to it. Maybe make a shark in the background. See? see? Fun way to show this is underwater? Draw a shark. anything else I need to talk about Poseidon? I think we got a pretty good clear. Let me uh, take this drawing off so you can see it a little bit closer. My little bit more in-depth drawing. It's not the best drawing in the world, but what's important is I drew it fast, and I drew it not caring if I screwed up, and there's a lot of mistakes, and I hope I'm going to point him out, like, look, like, lines don't match, his face looks weird, but that's okay. I was having fun drawing this. And if you want to draw really good, it's really important to practice and just kind of keep drawing until it comes out close to what you see in your head. I never know 100% how it's going to come out. I draw fast. It's always a happy surprise, and it's the best way to draw in the world. And I've been so happy to see you guys draw. So today, your drawing assignment, you can... Of course, I would love for you to do like a portrait of Poseidon. But how about if you feel like you want to go a little bit beyond that, and some of you already do this, so great. How about you draw Poseidon in his element? 
And maybe his element is underwater. Maybe his element is he's creating a huge earthquake. Maybe his element is he's riding a horse. I don't know. I mean, that's weird. I feel like I've never seen him ride a horse. Oh, I was going to talk about that real quick. The horse thing, right? It seems incongruous. Like the earthquake and the ocean, you can see the connection. I've heard it said, and I think this is true, that the first people who worshipped Poseidon were people who rode horses. And they would ride across the fields on the back of horses. And the feel the horse's hooves would hit the ground, it would reverberate and shake like an earthquake. And eventually these people, as they migrated and they came to the Mediterranean Sea, they hit the water and they still had this god, this Poseidon. It's an early Poseidon. It's like Poseidon before he's got the mustache. He's not fully formed. They take this god of horses, which is super important to them, and this god of earthquakes, which they know that the horses create, and they they take to the sea for the first time. And then Poseidon becomes a god of the sea. And he kind of mingles in with the pantheon. There's a lot of really cool stuff. If you want to get into some really interesting reading, try reading about the roots of the Greek gods because there's roots that go back so many years and they're incomplete. We have a pretty clear view of where Zeus comes from, but the other ones, there's a lot of guesswork, but it's always fascinating. And all these different cultures have different ideas that feed into it. And so that's the theory about Poseidon. That was like a horse riding race of people. I don't know, that's pretty cool, right? Like his first thing is horses. Now it's the thing you always kind of say like, it's like a surprise, like, did you know <laughs> that he was also the god of horses? You're like, what, like sea horses? No, normal horses. So, okay, that I think is enough for me to talk about Poseidon. Um, we're gonna keep doing these. So if I didn't get to your favorite fact about Poseidon, don't worry, I'm definitely gonna circle around and talk more about Poseidon. Maybe more specific things about Poseidon, maybe specific Poseidon myths, or Poseidon's relationships to other people and stuff. But this is the part of time that I would like to throw it open to somebody, to questions. So um, I'm doing this solo today. Normally, uh, the lovely Nicole has been writing questions down the entire time. So there might be a little bit of a delay, uh, especially as I'm going to just call up myself. I'm going to start watching myself on Instagram. Boy, how does that work? Can I do that? Am I going to mess this up? Let's see. I might mess this up. I'm going to do this. I'm just going to watch on the phone. Okay. <laughs> so I can see somebody's asking for book recommendations. I'll be happy to supply a few, and I'm going to do them at different age levels. In fact, if you have any of my books at home, the Olympian series, I'm pointing off camera where my Olympians are. Uh, I always include a few book recommendations like books that I felt did a great job or informed things well for me. Um, first and foremost, Delaire's Book of Greek Myths. I love Delaire's so much. It's one of the best collections of Greek mythology I've written. It's for kids, but adults should read it too. Um, the, uh, the Delaire's did an amazing job of kind of taking all the different threads of Greek mythology because um, there's so many different versions. There's no Bible. Every like region, every town had its own version of a story, and they're often very contradictory, and they kind of combined them all together and made this like beautiful tapestry that comes together. Um, let's see. Did Poseidon ever have a myth with this other boy, and he, got, and he later got the boy turned into a shrimp, and there's an Aphrodite, Aphrodite one too. Have you ever heard of that one? No. I haven't. And if somebody could do some research about that, that would be very interesting where Poseidon, like, I don't know, is he like in love with the boy or is he in competition with the boy? Um, he turns the boy into a shrimp? I wanna, I've never heard that story. If someone has that, please send it to me. Oh, you can email it to me at my email, georgeoconnorbooks at gmail.com. This is also a great place to send any drawings you may do. Um, let's see. We have a question, who are Poseidon's wives? So Poseidon's like queen, his wife above wives, is uh, Amphitetri, who unfortunately in the Olympians really has only appeared in little bits. She's really not been very much of a, an important character. And that's uh, unfortunately a reflection of the fact that in myth, she doesn't really have much to do. She's just listed as the queen of Poseidon. Um, there is a really fascinating thread, which I touch on the Poseidon books, where um, there is a, a series of myths where Poseidon and Demeter actually have a kid together. And that kid is a talking horse. One of the things I write about in my books, Poseidon's kids always come out weird. I even say, in fact, I go so far as to say they're monsters. Uh, one of Poseidon's wives, so to speak, is Medusa. With Medusa, he has... Pegasus. Yeah, 
Pegasus is the kid of Medusa and Poseidon. Uh, with uh, the goddess Thaosa, I think that's your pronounce, the Thaosa, I believe, actually. Um, she's a minor goddess. He has the child Polyphemus, the Cyclops, that in the Odyssey eats Odysseus's men. So he's been linked with a lot of different people. Um, but Amphitetri is his proper queen. Let's see. Would I like to be a son of Poseidon? Um, <laughs> hmm. No. No. Because his kids either come out looking really weird, like they're horses or sea monsters. Oh, Triton. I was going to talk about Triton. Triton is his son by Amphitetri. Tri Triton, my favorite cool factoid. We all have seen The Little Mermaid, Disney's Little Mermaid, King Triton. King Triton is the son of Poseidon. And they did a Little Mermaid cartoon series. Disney did. It's not in the movie, but it's in the, like, the cartoon series where she refers to her grandpa Poseidon. She is literally the granddaughter of Poseidon. But Poseid Triton comes out of fishtail, right? Um, even when he has a human-looking kid like Theseus, Theseus is a monster. So I would not want to be Poseidon's son. No. Um... Did Poseidon's hair look like seaweed before he became the god of sea or just, just after? Same with all the other gods whose looks match with their patrons of. That's a great question. So one of the things that kind of come around in when I'm doing the, when I did the Poseidon book, Poseidon, for the most part, is unhappy in his allotment. You know, the, the three brothers, Zeus, Hades, Poseidon, they kind of divided the cosmos up. And Zeus famously got the sky, and Hades famously got the underground. They all shared the surface of the world, and Poseidon got the sea. And even though it makes so much sense, he is unhappy in it. But I think his unhappiness actually has a lot more to do with the fact that he's like the middle child, and he spent his entire life up until that point in his dad's belly. There's a lot of things to be upset about in Poseidon's case. But um, yeah, I kind of do draw him where he already has the seaweedy hair. So, and in the book, Poseidon, he kind of comes to the realization, it's like, <sighs> it makes a lot of sense that I'm the king, I'm the god of the sea. So yeah, he does have that. Some of the other hints that we have, um, like Demeter has her golden hair, the same color as grain. She has that before she comes out. Hestia has wreathed herself in flame. She's the god of fire. Yeah, it's kind of a little bit of fate playing there, right? Or at least me being kind of, uh, I don't want it to change their appearances too much. The big change is that when Zeus is first introduced in his book, he has light brown hair and his hair turns white after he's gifted electricity. And the white hair is to like symbolize that he's the god of the sky, so it looks like a cloud. So he actually does slightly change his appearance to match what he's the god of. That was a great question. Let's see, uh, I have to actually scroll through here. Uh, oh, this is a great question. Why did Poseidon make a salt water spring in the Athens competition? Could he not make fresh water? Did he think salt water would be helpful? So for those of you who don't know the story that, that, that is being referred to in that question, um, Athens, before there was Athens, there was a city, and there was a competition between two great Greek gods to see who would be the patron god of that city, Poseidon and Athena. Clearly from the name, we can guess who won. And in the competition, they meet on the giant rock, the Acropolis, where the, you know, the Pantheon is built to this day. Uh, no, no, the Parthenon, Oof, Pantheon's in Rome, Pff, guys. Anyway, they, the gods meet, and they, and uh, I think it's, is it Erechtheus? No, it's not Erechtheus. I forget his name. He's the legendary pre-king of Athens, and he, he, he challenges the two gods to, like, say, like, hey, like, you know, make a gift, see what happens. And Poseidon takes his trident, and he hits the ground and with these three holes, and this geyser springs up of salt water. And it's kind of like, you know, people are like, yay, water! And they run up, they taste it, like, blah, blah! Because if you ever drink salt water, it's terrible. And, yeah, um, why did he do salt water? Because then Athena's is like, nice job, uncle. And she hits the ground and makes an olive tree grow. And, man, if you've ever been to Greece or have read anything about Greece, like, olives, it's like, you might as well have made gold fly out of the sky. Like, olives is everything. They used olive oil to, like, for cooking, for cleaning. They would clean themselves with olive oil. Seems not very clean, but, like, they, it was used for everything. She gave them the most supremely useful gift. He made salt water. And honestly, yeah, I suppose he probably could have done fresh water. 
because he is, it's a minor attribute of him. I mean, you're getting down the list of things he's got of. He is the god of running water. That's like, I think that's maybe more of even a Roman thing because again, they were like more river people than ocean people, right? So he probably could have. I think he's just a little out of touch. I think it's just like, he, like I said several times and I'll keep saying about him, he embodies the sea. He is the sea. So when he strikes, when he gives a gift, he's going to give you the sea whether you want it or not. Let's see, what other questions do we have here? Um, <laughs> my mom, who's a librarian, said you really liked Poseidon when you were younger. Do you still like him a lot? Yeah, yeah. Uh, I think your librarian, I have a very funny story, which I'll save for another time, about uh, like one of my, like my first like date ever and like basically I pretended to be the son of Poseidon the whole time. It's tragic. It's a sad story. It's very funny really. Uh, but it's too long to get into here and it's also weird. But um, yeah, I really, like when I was a kid, I really associated with Poseidon. I didn't understand, I think, as much about Poseidon as I do now. There's definitely other gods and goddesses who I relate to more. But when I was a kid, I mean, think about this. Especially the time of the story, I'm like in my, like, like 12 or 13, that's a pretty hard time, especially if you look like me. And I looked really weird when I was then. I look more normal now. I was kind of a weird, nerdy kid, and there was going through a lot of big changes in my life and in my body. And so um, I think I, I would get angry about stuff a lot. I wasn't like an angry kid, like I wouldn't hit people, but I think there was internally, there was a lot of this like, what's happening to me? And how come nobody can explain this? I think that everyone goes through. And there was something about the way Poseidon would lash out that I strongly associated with. Nowadays, um, the gods who I look at more that I associate with, um, I, I, Hermes, I definitely associate with. Um, he's very, uh, he's, a, he's very much of a trickster. And uh, if you ever see me interact with other people, I almost always am just teasing people all the time. It's the way I relate to people. That's very Hermes. Uh, I relate a lot to Hera, weirdly which is, I don't really know why. I think I just, I associate very strongly with underdogs and she's, you know, I think she gets a bad rep. Um, weirdly, 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 I kind of associate with Apollo because Apollo is kind of, uh, I mean, okay. You know, sometimes like Apollo acts smarter than he is. And sometimes I think I do too. And I think, I think everyone does that. And like that part about Apollo, I, 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 I can see in the story of him and I always feel like I have a big spot in my heart for Apollo because he's kind of a boob, but so am I sometimes. Let's see. How different do you think things would have turned out if Poseidon won Athens? <laughs> That's a great question. Um, well, I think for if he won Athens... I think first off, Athens isn't super close to the water, right? I think he would have brought the water in closer. I mean, like, it, it's expanded out now, but at the time, Athens wasn't. Like, there was a separate port thing. Athens is spread out. Like, I think it would be it would be more, even more of a nautical city than it is. Um, it's a funny thing in Greek mythology. There is a lot of stories where uh, there are competitions between Poseidon and other gods for cities. And Poseidon always loses. And that's just a kind of thing you see like these weird echoes of stories. I, I don't tell them a lot because they get redundant sometimes. I think Athens is the big famous one, but he competed with Hera for Argos. And he competed with Helios for Rhodes. And he competed with Zeus for uh, maybe Olympia? But he always loses. Like he's always losing these, st these, st these stories. I've been to a city that was a Poseidon city. In southern Italy, there's a city that is now called Pestum but it was founded by the Greeks and they called it Poseidonia. And uh, clearly after Poseidon. And that city, uh, I mean, it was okay. <laughs> there, it was ruins now. There was like literally in the middle of nowhere. So it's hard to tell. So there would have been some differences. Um, let's see, a uh, couple things. Uh, somebody asked me if Poseidon styled my hair and uh, you will notice I am sweating profusely. So since he's the god of water, yes. Yes, he did. It's actually very hot in my house because I closed the windows. Um, what first sparked my interest in Greek mythology? Oh, man. Um, this is my little love letter to teachers, right? Uh, I was in, I grew up in Long Island, New York. Uh, you know, pretty close to where I live now, Brooklyn. And um, 
I was in a special program. It was like a trial program called STEPS. I don't know what it stands for. It was an acronym. But we did a lot of group-based learning. We would sit in a big circle. We would do a lot of uh, free associative writing, very similar to what my friend Julie, who has the three o'clock show at Word, uh, her thought of the day. You just kind of write anything, just thinking about it. Um, and we would learn stuff based on projects. And we spent like a month or two, like, like a lot of time, studying Greek mythology and all the things that tied into it, right? So we studied like actually mythology, but we studied like, like, you know, architecture, and we studied um, like the regions of Greece, and like language and all these things. It was such a great way of learning. And for me, like as a little boy who like loved He-Man and loved drawing monsters and loved drawing muscle men and stuff, there, I, I can't imagine a more exciting thing for to me have to, to turn me on to stuff. And that was the spark. I'll do a whole episode one of these days just talking about like the very direct line you could see of like how George was exposed to something when he was in third grade and it's shaped his entire life. Um, question, ooh, could Poseidon stop Typhon? Typhon. Typhon, uh, which, who I've spoke about in other um, episodes, and if you want to read about him, Typhon plays a very significant part in my book, Hermes. Typhon is uh, my favorite monster of Greek mythology. It was the, he's the last son of Mother Earth. He's like a storm, you know, Zeus is a storm god. Typhon's a storm monster. Uh, I, I, I feel like every episode I do description of him, so I'm gonna try to change things up, but he has like a hundred heads. He's huge, bigger than the sky. Um, he's armed with this, the adamantine sickle of Kronos, their father, which could like cut through anything. Um, I, that's a great question, because Poseidon, it comes down to, could Poseidon beat Zeus in a fight? Because Zeus loses his first fight against Typhon, but wins his second one when he's not surprised. And I feel the same thing would probably apply to Poseidon. I feel like he would be fighting Typhon and not realizing he had the sickle, and then Typhon pulls the sickle, and Poseidon's like, oh no, when he gets defeated. But then when he comes back to the rematch, I think he would know what to do. And like, if I were Poseidon fighting Typhon, I would just keep hitting the ground with my earthquake causing trident until the ground splits so wide that it doesn't matter how big Typhon is, he falls in. And plus on Poseidon, I'm super strong. I pick up, I li there's myths where he picks up whole islands and throws them. I'd just be throwing islands on top of that guy. <laughs> so yeah, I think Poseidon could defeat him eventually. That was another fun question. Uh, let's see what else we have here. <laughs> you said something about your Aphrodite looking like Sofia Vergara once. Do you have a dream cast of actors for your Olympians? And somebody else had mentioned that my version of the Aphrodite was their favorite. I want to say thank you. Um, my Aphrodite is not just strictly Sofia Vergara. She is equal parts Sofia Vergara and Beyonce. So unless I could, like, as far as the dream cast, that's super hard. Dream cast, honestly, for Olympians, cartoon. I'd, I mean, so here's the thing about these books. I do every single thing in these books myself. I write them, I draw them, I color them, I do everything. I'm a little bit of a control freak. And the thing, if you bring in an actor, they're an artist. They're going to have their own take on stuff. And I feel like the little part of me that's inside would be like, oh, that's... Like, they'll do something great, something way better than I could think of. But it would be different. So I would want to like them to look like my cartoons as much as possible, I guess. But that being said, I, I should be able to think of, I'm looking at a poster off camera right now. Like, I'm trying to think, you know what? I don't know, but I would love for somebody to write in to me, like like write in some of your casting ideas. That would be another great thing to send to George O'Connor Books at Gmail. Because that would actually be really interesting. There is one piece of casting I can think of. It's pretty obscure, and I think she's probably too old now. But um, if you guys know who B.B. Newworth is, uh, she played Lilith on Cheers and Fraser, and she was... Um, she she actually uh, like when uh, Chicago came back to Broadway, she originated the role of um, Velma Kelly. I always thought of her as Hera, but now I think she's probably Hera's got to look young because she's an ageless god, and I don't know how BB North is. She's still beautiful, so maybe she could. But yeah, that's the one piece I could think about in my head. Uh, let's see what other questions we have here. Um, why does Poseidon always give birth to weird children? 
Uh, it's not genetics, because I uh, the gods don't have genes. They are shape changers. I think my theory, it's two things. One, he's pretty unhappy, so I think somehow his mood, his personality, actually kind of gets in the mix. And so if his kids don't just come out weird looking, they come out kind of quasi evil like Theseus. That's one way. The other way is if you think about his element that's associated with him. Zeus is the air, he's completely ethereal. He's the sky, actually hair is more air, but whatever. Um, Hades is the ground, he's super solid, right? He is liquid, he's literally liquid. He could fill any shape, any form, like water takes whatever can container it's in. So I think that gives his kids a, a weird volatile mix. That makes sense. You know, it's because like it, he's not alone in that. Like Hermes also has kids who tend to be different. His kids tend to be a little bit more monstrous. Hermes' kids just tend to be like a little, a little funnier. I mean, I mean, I guess Pan's kind of like monstrous in a way, but like he's kind of adorable too. So there is this tendency among certain gods that their kids just kind of come out a little bit different. Have I read the Iliad by Gareth Hines? Yes. Gareth is great. I like to recommend Gareth stuff because people will write to me. Uh, they'll say like, hey, are you ever going to do the entire Odyssey or the entire Iliad in comics where I'm like, no, I don't need to because Gareth Hines already did them and they're great. And I've actually, uh, like Gareth and I are friends. I tease him because I'm like, you're insane. Like you cut almost nothing out of these giant epic poems. You had to draw and paint so much because he paints them too. There's so much work that goes into one of Gareth's books. Um, there's a lot of work that goes into my books too, but like not on the level what Gareth is doing. Like his books are like, I don't know, they gotta be, I mean, I should look on my shelf, but that would be boring TV. Um, they must be like 300 pages of comics, every single one painted. It's like, good Lord. Also violent, but you know, you're doing Greek myths. It's gonna be violent. Um, let's take two more questions maybe. Um, could Achilles kill Agamemnon? Yes, absolutely. Like, if it came down to it, Achilles is the nearly unstoppable demigod warrior. Agamemnon is the leader of the Greek forces in the battle against Troy. But, yeah, I mean, he's actually kind of lucky Achilles didn't kill him, because the Iliad opens up where they're in, like, you know, serious fight with each other. Um, let's see. Has who had any human kids? I'm not sure who that's in question about. Give each god a zodiac sign. Oh, that's an interesting idea. Um, I've seen somebody do that recently. I forget where. Um, that would be a fun thing for people to write in. I'm going to have to... Now, here's the thing. I have a suspicion some of them are going to be in the same... I mean, like, for instance, if we're really going to do sign zodiacs by birth months, then, like, I mean, Apollo and... Uh, and uh, Artemis, they're going to have the same sign, right? But that might be a fun exercise to figure out. And what's really cool, I don't know if you know this, a lot of the zodiac signs come from Greek myths. Like Scorpio, I'm a Scorpio. Yeah. Scorpio is the scorpion that Artemis sent to kill, or Apollo, depending on the version, to kill Orion the Hunter. Capricorn is the form that Pan took when he was fleeing Greece when Typhon attacked Olympus. So there's all these like things, they all kind of come in. Cancer was the crab that attacked Hermes, uh, Heracles when he was fighting the Hydra. So they all are Greek myths, they're just like kind of like weird side things to the Greek myths for the most part. So um, if anybody out there is like a real big Zodiac fan, please write in, because I would love to see that. That's really interesting, and that's actually, um, I have to ask my girlfriend, I'm not great with Zodiac. I know mine, I know hers, I know a few other people's, but I would love to really kind of explore that. Um, and I think, <laughs> I, this will be the last question. Uh, could Apollo kill Artemis? No, no, because um, the most important thing about the gods to keep in mind, uh, the Greek gods are immortal. Even if they wanted to die, they can't die. So even if there was like the worst fight in the world, which when Zeus fought Typhon the first time was arguably the worst fight in the world. And there was probably moments Zeus wished he could die because horrible things happened, but he couldn't. Gods are immortal. So no, no God could kill any other. So that's gonna be it for questions today. If you have any other questions, please write to them. Email georgeconnorbooks.com. Send me your drawings. Send me your zodiac signs of the gods. Send me any of the other things I asked for today. Um, what else? If you missed an episode today or an episode in the past, you can always catch it at my YouTube. 
George Olympians. I always put them up there. Maybe it takes a day or two sometimes. And finally, I'm going to leave you all with a sneak peek for who we're going to talk about on Friday. Um, I'm just going to tell you. It's Medusa. So join me here tomorrow at 4, and we're going to talk about that snaky-haired, not a goddess. This is our first non-god or goddess talk. We're going to talk about the much-maligned Medusa. Thank you all so much for tuning in. I'll see you all tomorrow. Bye-bye.